So I've got a millennial and, I, and, and I'm sort of thinking, gosh, they're just turned, they're not even considering because of the stories they've been taught. Guys, what, what do you, it, so, say, say this is a, a godchild I've got or a nephew, uh, um, how, would you, how would you go forward? I mean, w- w- would there be a website you'd send? I mean, how would you say, look, I think you've heard the wrong story. What would, just give us a strategy. I do wonder, because it, it was an Iron Bevin, I think, who had the great phrase, this is my truth, tell me yours, that we now live in an age in which there is an entitlement for us to tell our story. And I don't think our people necessarily tell their story that well. I think, as John was suggesting, they can go straight to proposition, and it can seem quite dull and dusty and removed. But I think when we've learnt to tell our story, which of course is what the Apostle Paul did, on numerous occasions, tailoring it appropriately to his audience. When we can tell our story, maybe when we've discerned the connection that there may be with our listener, we need to do that a lot better because people aren't going to say to you in today's culture, that's rubbish. They will honour you for your story. So let's, I'm not saying this is the complete answer no. at all, but I'm saying part of it is that yeah. we should be able briefly, without cliche, to tell our yeah. stories in winsome and, ways. And you see what's interesting with Talking Jesus, which has really struck me, this um, uh, uh, survey that's been done with mm. Hope UK and the Anglican Church and the Evangelical Alliance, is that you know, 67% of people in this country have a Christian friend they like. And what's the story about that Christian friend? Oh, they're selfless. Well, that's amazing. And, and yet, I think a lot of Christians, when I do evangelism training, I say, what percentage of people in this country have got a Christian friend they like? They go, mm, 15%. So they've heard that same story of we're ineffective, we're not having an impact. And I, I start those training sessions by saying, guys, you're doing great. People are, you're really living differently. And the neighbors like it. They might not like what, they, what, what you think, but they do like how you live. So it's having a confidence, again, in the, the story that we are telling in our lives, which is one of selflessness and service. I look at my church family at All Souls. They humble me at the way in which they just give themselves. They could cross the pain line a bit more on the evangelism front, but I can tell you what, they are, I mean, they are remarkable in terms of just loving other people. I think as, evangel- as evangelicals, we've fallen into the danger of thinking that people will be converted quickly. I think that's yeah. because much of our history is of bringing the gospel to people who were already in a Christian culture, and we were effectively encouraging people to believe what they already ought to have believed. Mm. And actually, some of the models in the New Testament of rapid conversion, Paul preaching, Pentecost, mm. they are the gospel going to people who are committed Jews in the synagogue or, or god fearers. Mm. And therefore, it's not surprising that they became Christians quite quickly. It was the fulfillment of what they were expecting mm. anyway. But actually, even in the New Testament, when the gospel goes to those who are pagans who have no Christian background, often it takes much longer. Mm. So Paul hires a lecture hall in Ephesus, and he lectures yeah, day after yeah, day after yeah. day. So I think if you've got your friend or your godchild or whatever who has little Christian background, we mustn't expect that one conversation is probably going to... It could do in God's mercy, but it's probably not going to. Most people's conversion story is quite a long process. Mm of having the gospel brought to bear on them. And I think as we engage with somebody in that situation, we need to start by remembering what's the story they've heard? What's the story they're believing? And then we need to subvert that story. We need to help them to critique it because the point of stories in the culture is they're taken on board unthinkingly and everybody assumes that those stories are true and are real. And we need to find ways of making them see the, the problems with the story. And then in its place, telling the different story of Jesus himself. And obviously evangelism in the end is ultimately about declaring who Jesus is and what he's done. It's telling his story. And then alongside that, we need to show them the story of what difference Jesus makes. Because I think for many people at root, they think Christianity has nothing to offer. They don't think it will solve the real problems they've got. And so what they actually need to see is the story in action. And in my experience, that is often the route for many people's conversions. The the conversion story I come across again and again in churches is is a person in the church, and I'll ask them, how did you become a Christian? And it usually starts with, I knew a Christian. They were a neighbor, a friend, a family member. They talked to me about Jesus. I saw something different about them. 
Then at some point they invited to, some, to me to something at church, an event, a service, a carol service. Quite often the person will then say, I went to church and I had all these sorts of expectations, but when I arrived it was totally different from what I expected. Um, the people weren't like what I expected and the way they related to each other was radically different. And I found myself attracted to it. And I found myself wanting to come back. And then I started coming back. And then they gradually engage with the message that's being heard. Often they undertake a course or read the Bible with someone. They become intrigued. And quite often I found that they've reached a point at which they've become a Christian, but they haven't quite realized they've become a Christian yet. Yeah. And I think one of the things we've lost confidence is actually the distinctive difference of most real Christian communities. We're used to being embarrassed by church. And that's because as Christians, when we're in the church community, we see all its flaws. But the new person who comes in actually sees something of the loving life. And that's often a very powerful way in which the story of Jesus is made real for them. It's interesting. My nephews just started working at All Souls and having had a pretty tough few years at university. And I mean, he's just, it's amazing. to it, I, It's helped me see my church in a new light, a kinder light actually, because I see him going, actually, he says to me, Rico, these people are lovely. They're really kind. And I'm going, oh. you know, but you forget, don't you? You forget that they are, they are led by, by Christ and his spirit. Yeah. I think of my own small church family and many other churches that I know, and there are not many communities in which you have such a range of people who are so diverse, different ages, yeah. Yeah. different educational backgrounds, different interests. In the human world, they wouldn't get on with one another. They wouldn't meet mm. together. They wouldn't connect. And yet, as the church, there is a love for each other. And I think Jesus' comment about sort of, by this they'll know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. In diverse church communities, that is, that is seen in practice in a way that we don't, I think, realize.